Thank you, Eric. This morning we have been praising God, thanking him for blessing us with yet another year's harvest. Just now I'd like us to take a few moments to think about Psalm 65 together, those verses that Eric has just read for us. And then, and then I'll say just a little bit about Psalm 67, which was our other, our other psalm for this morning. Okay, so what can we say about Psalm 65? Well, for a start, we can be fairly sure that, that it's a, a harvest psalm. The verses of this, the verses divide into to three sections, and the third section from verse 9 to 13 suggests it was written in thanksgiving for the annual harvest as a song used by God's people to praise him for providing the food that they need and enjoy. But this third section, thanking God for the harvest, it follows two other sections. The first describing worship at the temple, that's verses one, verses one to four. And the second section describing God's control over all that he has created, which is verses five through to verse eight. Together, these three sections tell us clearly that, that the harvest is entirely dependent upon God. God who answers prayer and who is in control of everything. Today's world with all of its modern ways of life means that, means that many people have become disconnected from the land. Disconnected from the land and, and from everything that's involved in putting the food we enjoy on the supermarket shelves. Sadly, you could ask some kids where an egg comes from and they, they simply couldn't tell you. But this little psalm, Psalm 65, with just 13 verses, reminds us that the whole process from beginning to end depends entirely on God. I encourage, I encourage you all to keep your Bibles as we look at it together just now. Follow along with me, even, even though the words will be on the screen, it's good for you to have that in front of you as well. In the first four verses, we can, we can picture the worshippers gathered at the temple, gathered to praise God. They've come together to fulfill their, their vows to the Lord. Look at verses 1 and 2. Praise awaits, or, or praise befits you, O God, in Zion. Zion is, a, is, is the name given to Jerusalem. So praise awaits you, O God, in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. O oh, you who hear prayer, to you all men will come. Now maybe they had promised, promised God that if he gave them a good harvest, they would thank him publicly. We're just not told, but, but the rest of this psalm makes that seem possible. The people knew that God had graciously answered their prayer, and, and therefore they're, they're confident Confident that he would answer their other prayers as well. And in particular, the prayer, that, that prayer at the end of verse 2, that all men, literally all flesh, would come to know God. They praise God as the one who answers prayer and who all nations would one day come, come to in worship. The writer of this psalm, probably David, has penned these words to enable the people to praise God as the one who, who hears and answers their prayers, past, present, and future prayers. They may be gathered at the temple to, to celebrate the harvest, but, but another matter, something, something of great importance fills David's mind. Verse 3 says, When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. As they gather for worship, David directs their thoughts to the purity and the, hol the, the holiness of God. In fact, it's very possible that, that verse 1 should be translated, To you, O God, belongs silence and praise, the silence of awe-filled reverence. And the reason for that awe-filled, silent reverence is here in verse 3. They were painfully aware, painfully aware of their own sinfulness as they stood before the overwhelming purity and holiness of God. You can, hopefully you can, you can imagine that. One, of the, one scholar imagines the people paused in, in silent anticipation as they wait for the sacrifices to be offered. 
Sacrifices which were necessary because of their sin. Sacrifices which would lead to their atonement or to their, to their forgiveness. Today, it's still an important aspect of our worship for us to consider our own sinfulness, to feel the, the painful remorse that it brings, and, and all, more, all the more so when we reflect on the perfect purity and holiness of our God. Because when we do that, only then, only then will we grasp how amazing God's forgiveness is. We first need to see the, the blackness, the darkness of our own sinfulness when we're confronted with the holiness of God. And only then will we see just how precious forgiveness really is. It's easy to ignore, to excuse, to, to minimize our own sinfulness. But whenever we do that, we, we actually diminish the wonder of God's forgiveness. And we, and we, we we'll never really know the, the relief and joy of having our slate, our slate wiped clean for eternity. So the people, the people singing this psalm, they know they are sinful, overwhelmingly so. But they also know that they are welcome in God's presence. How is that possible? Well, because God has forgiven their sins. That's what the end of verse 3 tells us. And it's not because of anything that they've done. No, God is the one who initiated it. He initiated it by choosing them, which we call election, and by bringing them near, which we call reconciliation. Let me read verse 4, a verse which is addressed to God. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. It's true that some who had gathered for worship were, were probably thinking of the harvest feasting and festival that, that would follow. Now we might we might find that hard to imagine. After all, none of us would ever think about our lunch during a Sunday morning service. But it's possible that those who were singing this psalm might have been thinking of the feasting that lay ahead. But David, in, in verse 4 of this psalm, reminds us, or, well, he reminds the worshippers about what will, what will truly fill their hearts and satisfy them. More than the, the good food, what would truly satisfy their hearts and that's simply to be in God's presence as forgiven people. That's where true blessing is found. And the same is still true today. God forgives. Let's never, let's never lose sight of that. And it's a wonderful, astonishing truth, especially, especially when we remember that our forgiveness cost God his own son. Each time we think of that, it, it causes us to thank him and praise him more and more. That through faith in Jesus, by trusting in him, our sins can be forgiven. But let's get back to, let's get back to Psalm 65. Everything that we've, we've seen so far would have helped the people realize just how holy God is and therefore, how special it was that God in grace would bring them near to himself. God the Holy One meets with unclean people who have been pardoned. People who, who have been forgiven by him. Just think for a moment how amazing that is. That a holy God would meet with sinful people. In the second section of this psalm, which as I've mentioned is, is verses 5 through to verse 8, in this second section, David considers that the power of God, power which is seen in the ways that God has answered prayer, and particularly in how he has rescued the people of Israel. Verse 5 says, You answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness, O God our Saviour, the hope of all the ends of the earth, and of the farthest sea. 
the logic here is, is brilliant. The logic is that because God, has, because God had kept his promise to rescue Israel and had been their savior, there is certain hope that God's promise to, God's promise to extend his blessing to all nations, that promise will also be fulfilled. And the fact that you and I are sat here in church this morning is proof that God did keep that promise. Verses six and seven, in addition to being, in addition to being the redeemer, the rescuer, God is also the, the almighty, all-powerful creator, the one who planted the, mount, the mountains, who calms the oceans, and who controls every nation. This, says verse 8, should enable people everywhere to realize that there is someone, a, a supreme being, who is in daily control of this whole universe. Even people who are unaware of what God has done for Israel should realize that. And on top of this, on top of this, all people everywhere, when we experience God providing for our needs, and bringing joy into our lives. We should realize that this doesn't just happen by chance, but instead all these are, are gifts, gifts from our gracious, loving creator. This is especially true of the, of the food which God provides. Everyone, there are, everyone, and this world has been provided for. The problem often is that we simply don't distribute it. We don't simply distribute it fairly. God's provision, which we celebrate on this Harvest Sunday, God's provision takes us, well, that takes us then into this, this third and final section of, of, of Psalm 65, which as I've mentioned is verses nine through to 13. Here, David acknowledges that, that the Lord had granted a bountiful harvest and thanks, thanks him for sending the rain. We don't often give thanks for the rain, but David thanks God for the rain which ensured that there would be ample crops. Verse 9 and 10, you care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with corn. For so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You can almost, you can almost feel the splash of the raindrops. You can almost sense the, the crops growing and, and flourishing in that fertile soil. Praise God. Praise God for the harvest because he is intimately involved in, in every aspect of it. Let's thank and praise him. Don't let today end. We've been, we've been doing that together here as a congregation, thanking and praising God. But before this day is over, I encourage you to do that. Do that privately, personally. Come before God and thank him. And in verse 11, David, David compares God's generosity to a king with a, with a cart or a wagon who provides a rich harvest wherever he goes. What a beautiful picture of how God delights to give in abundance from his throne of grace. So generous is God's provision. It speaks of, of meadows covered with flocks and, and valleys blanketed with corn. So bountiful is what God provides that even the creation itself, we're told in these verses, the animals in the fields, all creation seems to be singing in praise of our creator God. We're going to do that in a moment or two when we sing again, but not just yet. For a few moments, I want us to think briefly at Psalm, or look briefly at Psalm 67, which is our second Psalm for today. And here, here I'm taking the, following the approach taken by a guy called Christopher Ash. except I'm compressing it. I'm squeezing it a lot. So the aim expressed in, in Psalm 67 is that, is that there will be praise for God's saving grace from people throughout this world. 
which if you remember is what the Lord had promised to Abraham way back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. Now just like the previous psalm, this one, Psalm 67, is a psalm of harvest too. Specifically asking that, that as the nations see, as they see blessing poured out on God's people, they also will be drawn to join in the worship of the Lord. Look at the prayer in verses 1 and 2. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Verse 1 that's there either on the screen or on the page in front of you. Verse 1 closely echoes the, the words of that priestly blessing in Numbers chapter 6. Those words that we sing sometimes after, the, after a baptism, you know, with the Lord bless you and keep you to make his face shine upon you. You know those words? Well, you'll see them echoed in this verse on the screen. And that's important. It's important because this blessing is given to God's covenant people. God's covenant people whose sins have been, have sins have been covered by the sacrifice offered by the priest. To have God's face shine upon us is a picture of that, of that right relationship with the Lord which is being prayed for as we sing this psalm. And the benefit of this ought not to stop with us, but we should pray that God's blessing, that God's blessing is seen in our lives, and as that happens, that others will come to know God's ways, that they will come to know God's ways through our grace-filled, transformed lives, resulting in them being led to salvation too. So as Christopher Ash points out, he says, the cry of verse one and two is not a self-centered prayer of please bless us and make us feel good. That is made clear by the longing expressed in verse three. What we most deeply desire, the, yearn the yearning that the psalm plants in our hearts, is that the peoples will praise God. Just look at verses 3 and 4. I'll read them for us. May the peoples praise you, praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. We can't be satisfied with, with only a few from just a, a handful of nations hearing this good news. No, people everywhere must hear of God. They must hear of God so that, so that people from the nations, that they will come to follow and to joyfully worship the Lord too. So the work of the gospel, it falls to each and every one of us. And whenever verse 5, if you look, you'll see verse 5 is exactly the same as verse 3 almost. When verse 5 repeats verse 3, it reinforces this glorious purpose of God, which is being fulfilled each and every day as we see the church grow. In closing then, notice how verses 6 and 7 echo what we read back in verses 1 and 2. But in particular, notice that it's the, it's the blessing God gives by providing the harvest which should cause people to worship him. For the Israelite people living in the promised land of Canaan, God's faithfulness to them in, in blessing his people with a, with a gracious and, and generous harvest, that would have been visible to the people of the surrounding nations looking on. But all of this was dependent on Israel's faithfulness to their God. All of this was dependent on Israel's faithfulness to their God. And therein lies the problem. Because Israel con consistently failed in their faithfulness to God. Consistently they failed to remain faithful. Sadly, just like us, they were sinful people. But just like, with, just like with the other Psalms that we've looked at in this series, 
we find that God always intended to fulfill his promise through his anointed king, the Messiah, the Christ, who would be faithful in every way. Jesus lived a perfect, a life of perfect faithfulness to the Father. And by his words and his deeds, Jesus made known the ways of God, which Israel had sadly failed to do. And therefore, we can truly say that for us, for us, all the blessings of covenant relationship with God can be found in Christ Jesus and only in Christ Jesus. And as we experience this, and as our lives become more like his through the work of the Holy Spirit, then others will be drawn to worship God too. So let's do that now. Let's, let's sing together. And our final hymn this morning is inspired by this psalm, Psalm 67. Let's stand and sing, May the peoples praise you. Let's stand.